Sources telling me at this hour some House Republicans have been in contact with and have started an effort to draft former President Donald Trump to be the next speaker. And I have been told uh, that uh, President Trump might be open to helping the Republican Party, at least in the short term, if necessary, uh, if it's needed. Fallout from yesterday's vote to oust Kevin McCarthy as speaker continues today, but the search for the next speaker is already underway, with Sean Hannity reporting that Donald Trump is actually being floated as a potential replacement, at least according to his sources. Now, something tells me that the source in question here is just Donald Trump, because when Trump was asked about this, his response was nearly identical to what Hannity's source told him. Would you take the job? A lot of people have asked me about it. I'm focused. You know, we're leading. I don't know you. I'm sure you don't read too much in the papers. But we're leading by like 50 points for president. You know, my focus is totally on that. If I can help them during the process, I would do it. So Trump is willing to, quote, help. But I don't know what that means. Are you saying that you would temporarily step in? Because that's not needed since there's already a temporary speaker. So... What exactly does help look like with regard to your role here? And I don't think that he knows, but basically once this was spoken into the universe, Republicans were very quick to get on board. Republican Troy Nell, for example, intends to nominate Donald Trump and claims that other Republicans are also willing to get on board, writing on Twitter, many America First patriots support my nomination of Donald J. Trump as the next Speaker of the House. I have personally spoken with Representative Luna, Greg Stube, Ronnie Jackson, Barry Moore, and many others. Let's make America and the House great again. But wait, there's more, because Marjorie Taylor Green also endorsed Trump, saying, The only candidate for speaker I am currently supporting is President Donald J. Trump. She later added, He has a proven four-year record as President of the United States of America. He received a record number of Republican votes of any Republican presidential candidate. We can make him speaker and then elect him president. He will make America great again. So he's got the coveted MTG endorsement. Shocker, I know. But what do more influential Republicans have to say about this? Because Jim Jordan, who also is considering throwing his hat in the race, was asked about this. And um, here's what he said. Donald Trump has been contacted uh, about possibly him being an interim speaker. Is that a reality? I don't know. He'd be great, but I, I actually I want Donald Trump to be the next president of the United States. If he wants to be speaker, well, he great. still. But, well, he, uh, I, I want. I'll be I want clear. Him, I want him to be he'd president still of the United run States. for president. He's still he's Good. still going to be I, running I want for him president. To be. No, right. That's where we need him. Is at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. If he wants to be speaker, then that's fine too. Oh, Trump wants to run. Well, mm, I was considering running myself, but I mean, I guess that if Trump wants it, then I'll happily step aside. Anything for Daddy Trump? In fact, Mr. Trump, if you're watching, uh, sir, do you need me to wash your car or pick up your suits from the dry cleaners? Embarrassing. Now, the question is, can a former president who's not a member of the House become the speaker? And the answer to that question is yes. However, Earlier this year, Republicans unknowingly adopted rules that would later disqualify Donald Trump. As HuffPost explains, there's a big problem with the GOP plan to make Trump the first non-member to wield the gavel, their own rules. Representative Sean Kasten gave his Republican colleagues a reminder of Rule 26, which was adopted in January and states that any GOP leader indicted of a felony with a potential prison sentence of two years or more needs to step aside. Trump has been indicted on 91 felony charges, many of which carry potential sentences far above two years. So, so in other words, just when I thought that this shit show couldn't possibly get any more entertaining, Republicans of the past decided to hit their future selves with an Uno reverse card. And it is genuinely magical. And just so we're clear, let's look at the rule before you cry fake news if you're a Trump supporter. Sean Kasten tweeted a screenshot of it, which clearly states, quote, a member of the Republican leadership shall step aside if indicted for a felony for which a sentence of two or more years imprisonment may be imposed. But he didn't just pull this out of thin air. So if you go to the official Republican website, they list conference rules that they all voted on, by the way, which I'll link to down below. And if you scroll all the way down to rule 26, you can see it right there. And the reason why I'm being extra scrupulous is because I already know that Trump supporters are going to come into the chat and scream fake news. But I mean, it's right there. It's linked down below. So 
See for yourself. Now, when Republicans in the House agreed to this rule package, Trump had not yet been indicted, nor had they anticipated a situation where they need him to serve as a potential House Speaker. But unfortunately for them, their own rules came back to bite them in the ass in a very big way. And that's too bad for them because he was the only person who I actually think could unite all House Republicans. And after McCarthy was ousted, it's weird. You would think that they would lower their expectations since they have to find a consensus candidate, but it seems as if their standards have all gone up. For example, Marjorie Taylor Greene is no longer supporting a speaker who pledges aid to Ukraine, even though she supported McCarthy. And yes, he did use Ukraine aid as a bargaining chip, but he still vocalized support for funding Ukraine. Now, additionally, Representative Anna Paulina Luna, who also supports Trump as speaker, says that the next speaker must defund Jack Smith's investigations subpoena hunter biden and also bring an impeachment vote on joe biden to the floor even though there's absolutely zero evidence of wrongdoing from biden and this is something that mccarthy himself didn't want to do because it would be an embarrassment to the gop so the hardliners are hardening their position when they should be softening it currently if they ever want to find a new speaker meanwhile the pro mccarthy conservatives are pledging to not support a candidate unless the anti-mccarthy republicans lose their leverage for example carlos jimenez tweeted i'm not supporting anyone for speaker until there is a commitment to reform the motion to vacate the coup against speaker mccarthy was despicable and must never happen again no one can govern effectively while being threatened by fringe hostage takers and i understand why he feels this way but people like matt gates would never agree to that because the motion to vacate is what gave them so much power and leverage in the first place so they're not going to just willingly give it up and since you need their votes for the next speaker you're kind of stuck right so they're at a stalemate both factions want things that the other faction does not want, and that's going to make it very difficult for them to all agree on one speaker. But we kind of just glossed over the fact that a Republican just accused his own colleagues of doing a coup against McCarthy. That is a very strong word to use, and he's not the only Republican who's pissed off. So here's what other Republicans said about the so-called hostage takers. Those eight people are anarchists, and they're Chaos Caucus members. And the fact of the matter is they get their power from the 212 Democrats voting with them all of the time. And so they have demands that nobody can meet. There's just too many people who are willing to lie to our own voters and, and say, well, they didn't deliver. They refused to deliver. Well, it's like, explain the mechanism by which that delivery would have occurred. Under, given the political reality we live in. So they're anarchists. They're lying to voters, according to Dan Crenshaw. But I also have to play Chip Roy's comments that took place before the vote because he literally threatened to fight Matt Gates, And I cannot get over that. Even if you've seen this, we've got to watch it again. Come at me and call me a rhino. You can kiss my ass. Look, I've spent a lifetime fighting for limited government conservatism. I have laid it all on the line. I've not seen my family for two days in the last 30 days. You go around talking your big game and you thumping your chest on Twitter. Yeah, come to my office, come have a debate, mother. You know why? Because I'm standing up for this country every single day. Still amazing to see that clip. So needless to say, most House Republicans are pissed that McCarthy was ousted. And in the propaganda sphere of conservative politics, they've also got some harsh words for Gates, along with the seven other Republicans who voted to oust McCarthy. They're traitors. All eight of them should, in fact, be primaried. They should all be driven out of public life. What they did was to go to the other team to cause total chaos. We ought to be focusing on Biden. We ought to be focusing on the economy. We ought to be focusing on the border. Instead, you're going to get a week or 10 days of the media focusing on Republican disarray. It's an astonishingly destructive behavior by a handful of egocentric people who think they're superior to 96% of the conference. And I do encourage all of the voters in Florida district number one, Matt Gates's district, to really vote him out of office. Send a message that this type of behavior is uncalled for, it's unnecessary. So we're to the point where guests on Newsmax are calling on voters to vote out Matt Gates, a Republican. And on Fox News, you have Newt Gingrich saying that everyone should view these eight Republicans who voted to oust McCarthy as traitors. These are very, very strong words. But even though Matt Gates may be public enemy number one, and there's literally talks of Republicans spell expelling him from Congress, that's happening. I did a video about that. Check it out. This whole debacle has created really strange bedfellows. For example, earlier this year, Nancy Mace said this about Matt Gates' shenanigans. How are you going to work with these folks to, to get anything done for the American people? 
It's going to be very difficult. Matt Gates is a fraud. Every time he voted against Kevin McCarthy last week, he sent out a fundraising email. Uh, what you saw last week was a constitutional process diminished by those kinds of political actions. Yeah. Well, fast forward to today, and uh, she is now on Matt Gates's side because she is one of the eight Republicans who voted to oust McCarthy. And she even joined him on his press tour to talk about this. But while she was on Steve Bannon's war room, things got really awkward because she made enemies with lots of these people, and um, they remember. I don't quite understand why so many people characterize our movement as, uh, and by the way, people including the New York Times reporter you have sitting in the corner in the war room right now, when they write about me, they say things like, Kaboom. they say things like hardliner, ha the hardliners, ultra mega, oh, ultra yeah, mega. yeah, the, 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 the far, far right, right. Far right. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, look at, well, look at who, you, look at, let's talk about this for a moment, <laughs> okay, Nancy is not a hard right uh, uh, I, in, you know, intransigent lawmaker, but our Venn diagram overlaps Didn't she around vote spending. To send me to federal prison. For I like four the months? Constitution. I'm a constitutionalist. Okay, okay. okay. getting hot. My, 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 no, my, my appellate lawyer would disagree about that, but that's not a deal. So, so, but, but. Mm. Did you see the look on her face? That was so awkward. I would be really uncomfortable if I were in that room. But I mean, Nancy Mace. She's choosing to align with people who she once made enemies out of, and that's not going to be a very non-awkward alliance, we'll say, for lack of a better word. But, I mean, let's talk about what's happening right now because I do think that it's important. First of all, the temporary speaker has been named by Kevin McCarthy, and that individual is Patrick McHenry, another McDipshit, if you will, and he seems to be out for vengeance. So I do want to go back to yesterday before the vote took place while debate was still happening because he took a jab at Democrats because they didn't bail out McCarthy because I guess he expected them to. I understand where the liberals are. I know you can support the constitutional order, except in a moment like this when you are questioned on that. I understand that. You can't be counted on in a moment like this with the state of the speakership. Why would you expect Democrats to come to McCarthy's rescue in the first place? That's delusional. First of all, Republicans would never do the same for a Democratic speaker, regardless of what they're saying now. But why is it their job to bail out Republicans when the extremists that they've pandered to and emboldened for years have suddenly taken their party hostage? I mean, that's their problem, not the Democratic Party's problem. But McHenry seems to have an axe to grind. And on his very first day as acting speaker, he's already going after Democrats. As Politico reports, as one of his first acts as the acting speaker, Representative Patrick McHenry ordered former Speaker Nancy Pelosi to vacate her Capitol hideaway office by Wednesday, according to an email sent to her office viewed by Politico. Politico. Now, the reason why this is seen as a diss to Pelosi is because former speakers usually get to stay in their larger suites for the rest of their time in Congress. But McHenry is basically saying, you're going to have to get out because I want that room for myself. Now, this to me really is not that big of a deal. But what makes McHenry seem like a really big dick is the timing. And he can't control the timing, but the timing couldn't have been worse because Nancy Pelosi, she can't move her stuff right now because she's not in D.C. for a very good reason. Quote, sadly, because I am in California to mourn the loss of and pay tribute to my dear friend Diane Feinstein, I am unable to retrieve my belongings at this time, she said. Now, she added, according to Ross Story, this eviction is a sharp departure from tradition. As Speaker, I gave former Speaker Hastert a significantly larger suite of offices for as long as he wished, she noted. Office space doesn't matter to me, but it seems important to them. Pelosi added, now that the new Republican Republican leadership has settled this important matter, let's hope they get to work on what's truly important to the American people. Now, on top of that, Jake Sherman of NBC News reports that Steny Hoyer was also kicked out of his hideaway office, and the GOP sources tell them to expect more. Now, yes, this does depart from tradition, but you're not automatically entitled to a bigger office because you used to be speaker, so I really couldn't care less about this. But what interests me about this story is the sheer level of pettiness that we're seeing from Republicans. They are genuinely pissed off that Democrats did not come to bail out McCarthy. And that's so on brand for Republicans, but just funny to see it play out. 
in the way that they're doing this power move, right? But I mean, this is all temporary because McHenry isn't the permanent speaker, although it is possible that he's going to throw his hat in the ring. But CNN's Manu Raju kind of gave us the most up-to-date report on who the likely candidates are and what to expect going forward. So let's watch. So there are still some questions about the exact who exactly will run for the next Speaker of the House. There are several people who have been making phone calls to sound out their colleagues to see whether or not they have the support to replace Speaker McCarthy. McCarthy, among those people in particular, uh, Steve Scalise, who is the current number two, the House Majority Leader. He is one seen as a person that could possibly run here, as well as the House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan, who told me yesterday that he is open to the possibility of running, or he, he didn't rule it out, and he's signaled to his allies that he could be open to the possibility of running. Also, Kevin Hearn, who's a member of the Republican Study Committee, he's the largest conservative group in the House, has been talking to his colleagues as well. But others could also emerge. Patrick McHenry, who is now the interim speaker, is seen as a possible candidate as well. And they have to figure out the other candidates down the line, the majority leader position, something that the current Republican whip, Tom Ember, could potentially go for. But the big question is, who can actually get... 218 votes in the House. That will all take place next week. First, the House Republican Conference will nominate someone to be the next speaker. That requires only a half of the House Republican Conference. But then someone needs to be elected speaker, and that requires half of the whole House, 218 members. And with Republicans, who that means that their person will face the same issue that Kevin McCarthy did, can only afford to lose four Republican votes on any party line measure, which means that Kevin, the new speaker candidate, whoever that person may be, will have to ensure that the hardliners are appeased and those moderate members are appeased. But as you can hear from that clip we just played, there is just an enormous amount of frustration, tension within the room. Getting to consensus will be incredibly difficult for whoever the new speaker candidate is. So Republicans are in an impossible situation where they have to find someone who can appease both the far right and the moderate wing of the Republican Party when they're currently battling each other, openly exchanging insults, threatening to fight one another, if you're Chip Roy at least. So it's going to be very difficult for them to all agree on a candidate. But there is an alternative. So they could try to find a consensus candidate that Democrats will support that will leave out the far right and allow moderates to kind of come up with someone who's not as firebrand, but nonetheless kind of shun these right wing dipshits like Matt Gates and others. But I think that that's probably completely off the table, even for moderate Republicans. So odds are they're going to try to find somebody who all Republicans support. And if that is indeed the case, they're going to probably be deliberating for quite some time and judging by how things have gone thus far i'm assuming the process is going to continue to be a complete clusterfuck so we're gonna have to wait and see though but i for one am thoroughly enjoying the shit show and i will continue to give you updates as they come were you acting like a 